the earliest one that I can date or have a go at dating seems actually quite a few years prior to the ones of George Dyer and that the ones of Colin McInnes, only that he looks quite young, must be early 50s. So from the full set I can't trace it whether they were actually used or whether they were commissioned by Vogue or for mm -hmm. another magazine. I don't know if they were ever used. So there's a double exposure of Colin McInnes looking in a suit very like, I must say, the Man in Blue or the Businessman series mm -hmm. of Bacon paintings. And then the other one of Colin McInnes is interesting because more sort of correctly, I suppose to say multiple exposure. Yeah. Yeah. And this one is a multiple. This looks like three, potentially four, but I think three images there. And the fact that this image seems to work perhaps suggests a degree of skill in the positioning and the lighting and allowing the exposure to be balanced. Well, I was going to ask about how aware you think he was of other photographers, of surrealist photographers, of people who were working with, with those kind of manipulations, because he's also quite often presented as, uh, if not perhaps a naive photographer, as somebody who's kind of working as a kind of maverick. Um, yeah. And also, he was working as a commercial photographer. So this kind of link to more artistic photography is something which is interesting when, when we're looking at these manipulated images. Yeah. The arc of his artistic learning really, I suppose, took off when he became associated with Arthur Jeffries. So he was a bright young thing, millionaire, playboy, international playboy. They had a fairly sophisticated lifestyle, for, especially for the pre-war years, going to the Bahamas and New York and Mexico and Venice, living a kind of high life and acquiring pictures and paintings. He had a painting show in 1938 that by all accounts was well received. Very strange, sort of like really heavy impasto paintings that look very indebted to Ruo. Some people say that he found a camera at a party and picked it up and that's how he started photographing. I think we can say that he picked up an awareness of the variety of techniques of photography through a really interesting photographer called Barbara Kersima, who had her own studio and worked photographing kind of society people that she was connected to, for instance, of Nancy Cunard and various painters. And she liked experimenting with ideas that she picked up from European trends in photography, for instance, from Man Ray and Kurtesh, and liked using solarized kind of techniques in her society portraits. I discovered a direct connection to Deakin in the Barbara Kersima records and the archives that they hold at tape. Deakin actually features in them on really many pages. The potential for Deakin picking up an awareness of how you could function as a photographer, what techniques you might use, what were the latest trends coming from Europe, how you could play with the manner and the equipment is, I suppose, there's a really direct hint that uh, Barbara Cosima played a, a significant part in that process. She photographed him and she turns up in a photograph album that contains photographs of Deakin and a photograph of a person called Rosemary McColl in a double exposure. So whether Deakin took this double exposure or Barbara Persima is difficult to say. There are photographs by Deakin in the album stamped on the back with his photographer's stamp from before the war, which shows that he thought of himself seriously enough to have a stamp made. You know, he had a painting show in 1938. By 1939, he'd had a photography stamp made. So he had started photography and had started a studio and then the eruption of the Second World War displaced everything. During the war he worked for the Army Film and Photographic Unit where all sorts of techniques and tricks and things mm. like that would have been, if not taught, at least picked up because yeah. the teaching was actually fairly unformalised as far as I can understand it. Do you think the double exposures sit with any particular explored trail of surrealism? You know, because it's quite late really, isn't it, for people to be engaging with surrealistic ideas, yeah. but they were young men at the time when surrealism was really exploding and was, I suppose, was the new, what might be the most interesting sphere of art from the late 20s and 30s. But, you know, this is going into the 50s and the 60s. Mm. Do you think there was still a lot of playing around with surrealism? Do you think that's what this is? I think there certainly was in terms of commercial, Photography and also that surrealism carried on in 
all sorts of other places outside of Paris for a long time. I mean, well into the 1960s in, right. say, Czechoslovakia or oh, right. even in the United States where there are other photographers that are using these kind of techniques. I mean, I suppose it would have been fairly, not quite old-fashioned yet, but it would have been a yeah. little bit off-trend to yes. have been presenting exactly. yourself as a surrealist, yeah. which I don't think is what's happening here. But you can certainly relate it back to some of that earlier material. One of the original ideas that interested me when I started looking at the double exposures was where they sit in the grander scheme of modernism and 20th century art. Some of the key painters, when they were photographed, would appear as a double exposure. So, for instance, there's double exposures of Max Ernst, there are double exposures of Picasso, there are double exposures of T.S. Eliot, there are double exposures of Duchamp. Yeah. The earliest one I can find actually is for Degas, the painter, where he is photographed in a double exposure. So it seems like perhaps when photographers are looking for some way to express the all-seeing genius of characters, perhaps more famous artists that have a personality in the public eye, that the double exposure seems to fit in a fairly mm. consistent and universal way when they want to allude to you know, the explosive creative potential of their artistic mind, that it's not contained by one solid face. It, they need multiple exposures to illustrate the breadth and the depth of their thinking or that complicated identity of the creative. It seems to me really fascinating that Picasso actually generated his own double exposures and used them as the basis to generate works. Picasso actually photographed Douanier Rousseau in mm. front of a Rousseau painting. So there was a portrait on top of a painting, photographed them separately mm. and then superimposed them on, on top of each other. Because it seems to be fairly literal to the degree that makes me suspicious of it, the fact that a double exposure you know, in the way, particularly of these portraits, that they are the same subject in the same room at the, at the same moment, but just moved slightly. And that really does seem to be almost like a literal jump there to the multiple planes of cubism, the different angles, of, but all on the same viewpoint. Yeah, I mean, uh, if we think about what picture making does about pictorial representation, that it is taking a world which is not flat and mm -hmm. making it into a flat image, what enables you to do that is this kind of freezing of time, so it gets rid of all sorts of other aspects out of the picture, so to speak. So the double exposure kind of allows you to bring back that element of time and to represent mm. things from different angles and to represent different states within a singular image.